Good morning and welcome to SpaceX and Axiom Space's splashdown coverage of AX3, the third crewed mission to the International Space Station by Axiom Space. I'm Jesse Anderson, a Manufacturing Engineering Manager here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. And I'm John Rackham, Spacesuit Ventilation Lead for Axiom Space based in Houston, Texas. With over 21 days in space, our crew spent just over 18 days aboard the International Space Station. And while on board, they experienced more than 288 orbits and covered over 7.6 million miles. And now we are in the final phase of their journey. Over the next hour, we will follow the return of Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, Walter Villade, Alper Izarache, and Marcus Wandt as they splash down off the coast of Florida and bring the operational phases of the AX3 mission to a close. Over the last 40 hours, Dragon has been moving into position for reentry with downhill phasing burns, firings of Dragon's Draco thrusters to adjust the spacecraft's orbit in advance of returning to Earth. The next action coming up for Dragon will be to jettison the trunk, which is the cylindrical, unpressurized part of the spacecraft. Once the trunk is separated, Dragon will be running entirely on battery power. The trunk is currently connected to the aft or the bottom section of the Dragon capsule where the heat shield is located. From there, the spacecraft will use its forward Draco thrusters to perform a deorbit burn, which will last about nine minutes, and put Dragon on a trajectory to return to Earth. This will be the last time that we use those forward bulkhead thrusters. After, we, after that, we will close and lock the nose cone in preparation for reentry. During reentry, as Dragon passes back into the Earth's atmosphere, we will have an expected loss of communication, sometimes referred to as an LOS or loss of signal. This particular LOS is caused by the friction of the spacecraft pushing through the air at a high rate of speed to the point that it builds up a layer of super hot plasma around the vehicle. This plasma will dissipate and the communications will resume once the vehicle slows down. This LOS should last approximately seven minutes. Throughout this time, nitrox is used to cool the cabin and the suits to keep the crew comfortable. Nitrox is a mixed breathable gas that is also used in scuba diving. After we regain communication with Dragon, we'll have a couple minutes before the drug parachutes deploy. These are the two smaller parachutes that are designed to stabilize Dragon and begin to slow it down. Less than a minute after the drug parachutes deploy, we'll see release of the four main parachutes. These are the big orange and white parachutes that further slow the vehicle down. Over the course of three minutes, the drogues and the mains work together to bring the vehicle's velocity from 350 miles per hour down to just 15 miles per hour, at which point Dragon will splash back down on Earth. And when it does, SpaceX knows exactly where Dragon is expected to land with recovery teams pre-positioned in the area. These teams are trained to quickly make contact with the Dragon spacecraft, secure it, and then hoist it aboard, aboard the main recovery vessel. Dragon. From there, Eight teams seconds. will open the hatch and help Commander MLA. Five minutes. SpaceX Dragon, we cut. And from there, teams will open the hatch and help Commander MLA, Walter, Alper, and Marcus out of Dragon Freedom. Well, the AX3 mission has been remarkable from start to finish in a number of ways, and each of these missions iterate on the process of flying to and living on station. Each of these missions, each crew, help open that door to low Earth orbit just a little bit further. And this crew has certainly done just that, as they stayed very busy while on station. Yes, they have. So let's take a moment and properly introduce the crew. The commander of our mission, Michael Lopez Alegria, or MLA, is no stranger to human spaceflight. He is a dual citizen of the United States and Spain. AX3 marks his sixth mission to space, having completed three space shuttle flights and a Soyuz mission as a NASA astronaut prior to commanding AX1 with Axiom Space. MLA holds the NASA record for both the total number of spacewalks and the cumulative amount of time conducting spacewalks. Today, when not in low Earth orbit, MLA serves as Axiom Space's chief astronaut. And from Italy, our pilot is Colonel Walter Villade. This mission is his inaugural trip to low Earth orbit. Villade, a colonel in the Italian Air Force, currently serves as head of the Italian Air Force's representative office in the United States. He has completed cosmonaut training as a space engineer, participated in multiple analog training missions, and flown a variety of aircraft and missions as an active flight engineer in the Italian Air Force. This mission is significant for Italy in that it commemorates the 100th year since the founding of the Italian Air Force. 
from Turkey. Our third crew member is mission specialist Alper Izrachi. Through this mission, Alper has become the first Turkish astronaut to go to space. With 15 years of experience across a myriad of aircraft for the Turkish Air Force, Izrachi got his start in the in the Air Force Academy in Istanbul, Turkey, and er earned a master's degree from the U.S. Air Force Institute of Technology. He then flew as, as a commercial airline captain for several years before returning to duty in the Turkish Air Force. On a further note, this mission marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Republic of Turkey. And finally, from Sweden, we have Mission Specialist Marcus Want. A lieutenant colonel in the Swedish Air Force, Marcus flew nine years as a fighter pilot and graduated from the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School at the top of his class. In November of 2022, Marcus was selected by the European Space Agency as an astronaut reserve. However, with the AX-3 mission, he becomes the first project astronaut in ESA's history, a new designation within their ranks. And through this mission, he becomes only the second ESA astronaut of Swedish nationality to ever go to the International Space Station a milestone marked in a year of jubilee as the 500th anniversary of the founding of the country of Sweden. What an incredible crew. They have been well prepared and trained and have such an array and years of experience. Yeah, they really do, Jesse. You know, this is the first all European commercial mission to the ISS and these four men proudly represent the five nations um, that, they, that they represent. And, you know, their training has really brought them from launch to life on orbit and now into their journey back home. At the moment, Dragon is doing a couple of things autonomously. It is an autonomous vehicle. It's isolating the thermal control system fluid loops from the radiator. This system is what will help keep the internal temperature of Dragon temperate for, the, for our crew during re-entry. Next up, we are waiting for the claw to separate. The claw connects the trunk to the capsule, delivers power, telemetry, and fluids, and claw separation is the first step in trunk separation. And we are just about three minutes or so away from claw separation. Now what you're seeing there on your screen is a view of mission control here in Hawthorne, California. And again, in just a few minutes, we will have claw separation, which will be shortly followed by trunk separation, just about a minute afterwards. And then a few minutes after trunk separation, we will begin a deorbit burn that will help bring the dragon um, into an orbit that takes it down uh, ready for the landing zone. Yes, and while we're waiting for that, on your right of the screen, you see Mission Control Center and Houston, Texas, that is Axiom's Mission Control Center, also known as MCCA. And from MCCA, you know, teams have been uh, monitoring and supporting this mission. Deorbit sequence start. Copy. That's great. That's just the kind of call these crews are waiting to hear and these support teams are waiting to hear from Mission Control. Yeah, that, that call out just confirms that they are going to begin the deorbit sequence and claw separation again is coming up here in just a couple of minutes. And about a minute after claw separation, we will also have trunk separation. That is the unpressurized section of the vehicle that will jettison from the Dragon uh, capsule and expose the heat shield uh, that will be used as the vehicle and the crew re-enter into the Earth's atmosphere. And again, on your right, you see views of MCCA, Axiom's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas. And really, this is kind of the hub of our operations for supporting the AX missions. So AX-3, um, throughout the course of their time from launch into orbit on ISS and now coming back home, has been supported 24-7 by this team of, um, of flight controllers. Um, they support things from uh, payload and stowage operations to payload support and integration and just helping crew maintain and schedule their day. Yeah, it's awesome to see both teams working in tandem, yeah. help bring the AX-3 crew back home to Earth. Now we should be coming up on claw separation here 
um, pretty shortly, so just waiting for that call out. And if you're just joining us, we are expecting claw separation here any moment now and just waiting for the call out. Once we do have claw separation, about a minute later, we will be able to jettison the trunk from the dragon capsule. Nominal trunk jettison. Copy. And great news. We did hear a call out confirming trunk separation. That means that we also had claw separation, which uh, prepared us for that trunk jettison. So that means that telemetry is looking good. The nitrox system is primed for cabin and suit cooling, and the heat shield is exposed and ready for atmospheric reentry. Up next is the deorbit burn. This is the last time that the forward Dracos, which are the four thrusters located on the top of the vehicle, will ignite. The deorbit burn will place Dragon on a precise trajectory to return the, to the splashdown zone off the coast of Daytona, Florida, and will last approximately nine minutes. Yes, and while we're you know waiting for those calls, it's really kind of is starting the dynamic phase of what we're looking at for this return trip home. Yeah. It's a very active day. Uh, we saw both mission control centers here in Hawthorne and then also in Houston, you know, really working towards all of that all of that effort to bring them home. So it's starting this dynamic operations, it's working through the procedures today, they're, they're ready for this type of operation and really we're getting into a lot of excitement here today. Yeah, and you say dynamic, there's a lot of things that are gonna happen right. very quickly. Um, each one of these milestones are, are only a few minutes apart, right. um, aside from the DO root burn, which will last about nine minutes, but it's like, it's a event after event. Um, so pretty exciting for the crew. Um, I'm sure they're very excited to come home. They've been in space for about 21 days yeah, now. 23 flight days too, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they will not miss the space views, but um, they're probably very, very excited to splash down back on Earth. I think they are, yeah. And you know, we, we were talking about waiting for those calls today, it being very dynamic. Really a lot of these dynamic phases are started by each of those calls and the crews on, on ground um, supporting off the coast of Florida are all waiting for those calls to hear so they know that we're on track for the right operations that are coming next. Exactly. And again, if you're just now joining us, we are just waiting for the deorbit burn to begin. That should be coming in just about a couple minutes. It will last about nine minutes and will help reorient the Dragon capsule on a trajectory that will line it up uh, in preparation for its landing. Um, and splashdown is, you know, just under a couple hours away from now. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking forward to a good morning of um, uh, activity as we as we press towards crew coming down, splashing down. And then at that point, we're really ready to greet our crew home, you know, and learn about their mission, learn more about their mission um, and just really have them back on Earth. We're looking forward to it. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about Dragon. It's about 27 feet tall. Um, and you could see on your screen that the top portion is the capsule portion of the vehicle and the bottom portion is the trunk section. That trunk section is the unpressurized portion of the, the, the vehicle, which we did just jettison a few um, moments ago. 
Um, we no longer need the, the trunk there. You can see that the black portion of it, that is the solar arrays that provides power to the vehicle. But now that the vehicle is coming home, we are exposing or have exposed the heat shield, which is on the bottom of that capsule. And that helps protect the vehicle and the crew as it's re-entering back into the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so very exciting, very awesome vehicle, um, keeping the, the crew safe and cool. Mm -hmm. um, now that the trunk is separated, it's on its own internal battery power. Um, so it is keeping the crew cool, um, even though there's nothing connected to it. That's what the solar arrays are there for. It's uh, charged up those batteries. So now um, it has enough power to bring the vehicle and the crew back home. Right. And that, you know, that trunk for their... Oh, yeah. And there, actually, speaking of Dragon, we can see crew <laughs> comfortable in that live view on Dragon. Yeah, this is always a great view, seeing the crew inside of the capsule live as they are making their journey back home to Earth. And again, this is an autonomous vehicle, so really they get to enjoy the ride. They do have those display panels um, right in front of them so that they can monitor, you know, everything that's going on. The Each event that's happening, um, they're able to see and monitor those events there on your on that screen there that you're seeing. Right. Um, but it is an autonomous vehicle. So most of this journey, I, I hope that they are relaxing a, a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> And I think they are, you know, Jesse, I think they're I think they're excited to get home. But you can see there uh, front and center, right? Commander Lopez Alegria and pilot Walter Vilade. You know, they have pretty critical roles still to play on their trip home. Um, but like you said, being an autonomous vehicle, really, they are they are there to uh, to help ensure that the vehicle is is doing what it needs to do on its way home. It's a great view there over their shoulders of the displays that they're looking at um, to monitor their progress home and make those call downs to ground like we talked about to ensure that we're in the the right phases of dynamic operations and help ground crews synchronize on where they're at uh, in their day on Dragon. Yeah, and we did, we do expect that the deorbit burn um, has approximately started or should be starting here soon. Um, we're just waiting for a call out there. Um, again, the deorbit burn will last about nine minutes long. Um, and just some really cool views of the crew. You know, speaking of the views we see there, Jesse, one thing I'm really happy to see is the number of patches that are on the inside of the Dragon. <laughs> I, I think it's one of my favorite things that I, you know, patches are a huge aspect of spaceflight. Um, they signify what the mission was about, the crew that was involved, um, all of the um, significance of what that mission represented and seeing AX3 there now added to this Dragon capsule is pretty fantastic. It'll stay there being a reusable vehicle. It's going to keep staying there. Yeah, I love that they have started this tradition. So every crew um, that gets to fly in one of these uh, Dragon capsules, they put the patch yeah. um, inside there. And yeah. it's just like a really cool um, thing to see as as the number of patches begin to increase. And oh, this, yeah. is dr this, this is Dragon Freedom, um, and it has been reused uh, a few times now. And we are um, in the middle of that deorbit burn that we have been mentioning. It is uh, approximately nine minutes long. Um, and within the last 10 minutes, we've been able to uh, jettis jettison the trunk and, um, again, have initiated the orbit burn. Once it's time for our crew to splash down back on Earth, they'll be headed, heading to one of seven targeted sites supported by SpaceX. All of these sites are located off the coast of Florida, either in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. Spreading the supported sites across multiple locations helps to maximize the return opportunities for this mission in future crews, lowering the chance that we'll have to wave off due to bad weather. Since Dragon is capable of splashdown on either side of the Florida panhandle, we have two identical and fully equipped recovery vessels ready to support, one in the Gulf of Mexico, which is Megan, and the other in the Atlantic Ocean, which is Shannon. Yes, and taking into account many different variables, including what landing sites have favorable weather, SpaceX teams have selected a primary landing site off the coast of Daytona, Florida, in the Atlantic for today's return. There are a number of weather-related items that play into splashdown and recovery operations. Some of the more obvious factors that impact operations are rain or chance of lightning in the recovery zone, both for the safety of crew inside the capsule and the recovery teams on the water. 
But we're also looking for wind speeds to be less than 15 feet per second, or about 10 miles per hour, and relatively calm seas, so that we can safely execute recovery operations, which includes landing a helicopter on the recovery ship to fly our crew back to shore. As you can see, there are a number of variables and criteria that come into play, and they all help ensure safety for both the crew and the recovery teams. But the weather conditions today are looking great for splashdown. For these operations, SpaceX closely coordinates with the United States Coast Guard to establish a safety zone to ensure public safety and for the safety of the, those involved in the recovery operations, as well as the crew on board the returning spacecraft. Multiple notices are issued to the mariners in advance and during recovery operations and Coast Guard patrol boats are deployed to discourage boaters from entering the splashdown zones. That's right. And we want to stress to the public the need to respect the safety zone. Recovering a spacecraft from the water is a very hazardous operation, and any other boats interfering in the area not only increases the risk to the astronauts in the capsule and the teams working to recover them from the water, but also to themselves as well. So for the safety of the crew, as well as your own safety, we recommend you sit back and watch the teams who have trained extensively for this moment do what they need to do. And speaking of training, as you might imagine, astronaut training can be extensive. From training that is specific to each crew member's role to learning SpaceX protocols, ISS systems, and preparing for the science and outreach activities they conduct in space, private astronaut training is rigorous. For SpaceX-related efforts alone, the AX3 crew spent about 35 days altogether training inside of Dragon. As we continue to await word on the deorbit burn, let's share some of the range of these efforts with you now. To prepare them for flight, our teams at SpaceX spent the last several months teaching the crew about orbital mechanics and how to live in microgravity. We also used our Dragon training capsules to run simulations of ascent, ISS rendezvous, and re-entry. The training program includes nearly 100 different lessons covering all aspects of the flight. The team also spent time at the launch pad in our suit-up room and working through emergency procedures that would be necessary in the unlikely event of a pad abort scenario. And beyond these efforts to get to and from station, this crew also spent months training for their time on orbit. So the crew spent an extensive amount of time in historic Building 9 at the Johnson Space Center, learning from certified instructors on all critical systems necessary to ensure a successful stay aboard the orbiting laboratory. The team even prepared for unlikely emergencies and learned how to provide first aid in a microgravity environment. Additionally, they learned how to prepare food and make selections in their meals, as well as learning how mission control operates to better ensure mission success during their flight. They also had a chance to familiarize themselves with the gear that will enable them to document their trip, their research, and help them connect with those back here on Earth during their outreach events. And ESA and JAXA also played a critical role in cruise training. Each module has its own nuances, so gaining insight into the specialties of their racks and modules is necessary, especially for this mission. Extensive training on station navigation, on-orbit familiarization, emergency response, and just repetition of walking through these processes and procedures helps the crew maximize every second they have during their flight, which they did. Simulating science research, operations, and even discussing how to sleep in space are all necessary lessons on the path to readiness. And now, you can't truly experience flying space until you fly into space, but some really unique tools have been developed to provide the closest experience possible. An altitude chamber can challenge the body with oxygen deprivation in a controlled and safe manner. And human-sized centrifuges send the crew members for a spin to simulate the G-forces that will be experienced by the body during launch and re-entry like today. It can be a nauseating experience, but it does help the crew know what to expect to be as prepared as possible for what this day holds. And for AX3, the Italian Air Force, the Turkish Space Agency, and ESA each had their own specific mission objectives for their respective crew members. And together, we made sure that they were ready to meet these goals. Yeah, I've... I think it is pretty amazing all the work that these crew members put into training for launch, for time on the International Space Station, as well as returning back home. And I think people forget that you're not just training for, you know, the dynamic events of launch. You're also training for, you know, the science that they're doing um, mm -hmm. on the mission and, and for the AX3 crew, you know, the outreach events uh, that they're also doing um, throughout their mission. So it's not just, you know, one portion of the training they have to train on so many different things. You're right. They're training for like what you see here, right? They're training for capsule operations, for vehicle operations. They're training for their launch day, their, re their landing day. They're training for the life on orbit. What I love about it, though, too, is it's a whole network of training. It's not just crew. It's also all those ground teams that we saw that staff those control centers. 
each one of those flight controllers goes through a certification process. They train for this moment and for this mission as well. And together, that whole team and network knows exactly what to do throughout the mission. They're trained for nominal and off-nominal events. Um, and it's an entire journey for both crew and ground teams to really successfully accomplish this mission. And X3 is a great example of that. They succeeded in accomplishing all of their mission objectives. And this is a great culmination to that effort. Yeah, you make a great point. There are four crew members on Dragon, but they brought a lot of people with them from Axiom Space, from Dragon SpaceX. Dragon SpaceX, do your burn complete, performance nominal, nose cone closure is initiated. Copy all, SpaceX. And we just heard that call out that the de orbit burn is complete. In the background, Dragon is currently inhibiting those forward bulkhead Draco thrusters that we just used to complete the de orbit burn, ensuring it's safe to latch the nose cone shut for re entry. Also, the vehicle has initiated the Nitrox suit purge. This will help keep the crew cool and comfortable during re entry, which is coming up in just a few minutes. At this point, the nose cone is closing and protecting the forward hatch for re entry. The crew is using their screens to monitor the locking of the nose cone, which is, which is done by a set of hooks. And the crew, again, uh, as we mentioned, they use those displays to uh, monitor what's going on, but the vehicle is fully autonomous. Again, uh, they don't really need to do anything or control anything, the vehicle um, is flying itself um, and completed those deorbit burns uh, by itself. And now the nose cone is beginning to close, which will protect that forward bulkhead. Um, and we, we no longer need to use those Draco thrusters anymore. So that nose cone will help keep the capsule protected as it's re-entering back into the Earth's atmosphere. Right, and you know the nose cone really is another great example of that dynamic operation. A certain call out that we're waiting for to know that the vehicle is on a good, um, a good path on its timeline to get back home. Um, and at this point, you know, we really are waiting for a bit more of those dynamic calls, all those teams on the ground that were, are expecting those calls uh, to kind of know where we're at in our timeline so that we are ready and positioned on the ground to retrieve crew. Yeah, exactly, and in the next uh, about 20 minutes, we will have that expected loss of signal or that loss of communication that we mentioned earlier. That will be about a seven minute period uh, while the vehicle is performing um, atmospheric re-entry. Um, again, this is normal. This is the plasma building up around the Dragon capsule. Uh, the vehicle actually, the plasma around the vehicle gets to about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So Wild. it's really, really hot. Yeah. Um, and as we mentioned that the Dragon capsule is now beginning to flow that nitrox into the cabin um, and into their suits, that is to help keep them cool throughout that very hot period of time that's coming up um, in about 20 minutes or so. Right, you know, and Jesse, you keyed on a certain thing there that I think is really important to remember too. It's a nominal part of today's process, right? But it's a very critical aspect of it, a very important part. Um, but like we talked about a few moments ago with training, it is an aspect of training to understand what a planned LOS is and then to mm -hmm. understand what do you do during that time. There's a lot of situational awareness that goes into when you're in a planned LOS like that, what are we doing to maintain awareness without that direct insight? And what are we looking for when we come back from that LOS or at AOS acquisition of signal? Um, and so leading up to an LOS, teams on the ground have trained for, what are we looking for? What are we going to be executing during that time? So we know when we come back for that acquisition of signal, here's where we are and here's where we need to go next. And I, I love that aspect of it. I think it's a really important thing to remember that these things are planned. It happens on ISS. You have them every day um, and you plan around them. And it's an important part of the space flight a, a port, it's an important part of spaceflight and specifically the journey home to remember. Um, and we've confirmed that the deorbit burn has completed. Uh, and the nose cone has uh, also uh, officially closed. So as we begin the second half of entry 
Dragon is now beginning to flush Nitrox into the cabin and continue to top off the AX3 cruise suits with cool air. Again, this is what will, will allow the cabin temperature to remain comfortable while external temperatures reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat shield is pointing forward, leading the capsule to the landing site. Crew Dragon's primary heat shield is comprised of PICO 3.0, which stands for Phenolic Impregnated Carbon Ablator. First generation PICO was first developed by NASA for studying and sampling comets with our solar system. SpaceX partnered with NASA to develop PICA X, which was the second generation product used on all Dragon Dragon 1 CRS missions that successfully resupplied the space station on 20 missions. Now, PICA 3.0 was developed specifically for use on Dragon 2 crew and cargo with enhanced structural and thermal properties that optimized the heat shield and drove down cost and mass. The remainder of the Crew Dragon capsule is composed primarily of SpaceX uh, proprietary ablative material. It's another class of thermal protection, which is lighter weight versus PICA and protects the underlying composite structure during reentry to ensure structural capabilities are maintained. While Crew Dragon will experience temperatures well over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit during peak reentry conditions, the characteristics of the TPS or thermal protection systems, coupled with the ECLS or ECLS environmental control and life support system in the pressurized interior, will ensure that the AX3 crew will stay cool and comfortable during all phases of reentry through through splashdown. Now, missions like this are important, not just for the crew members who fly, but also for the host of scientists and engineers around the world who had an opportunity to have their research or their technology tested in microgravity. And for Axiom Space, this is at the heart of why we do these missions. We are building opportunities for others to advance what is possible and expand on what is known. So for MLA, Walter, Alper, and Marcus, this has been an incredibly successful mission. Just to highlight and recap a little bit, the crew conducted a total of 54 research-associated activities around the mission, both on ground and on ISS. Now, 36 of these were on-orbit experiments and tech demos. This also included a slew of life science biology projects, human research projects, plant-based projects, physical and earth science projects, and like I mentioned, technology demonstrations. Additionally, time was focused on the maintenance of research equipment as well, and also just generally understanding how to live and work in microgravity. So, here are some highlights from their time on board the International Space Station to share with you. Now, on January 20th, Freedom Dragon docked to the ISS. And upon ingress to the ISS, the crew was greeted by the Expedition 70 crew in a welcome ceremony. And this really kind of started their entire 18-day stay on the orbiting lab, which was incredibly packed. So, over the next 18 days, Alper, Walter, Marcus, MLA all conducted a slew of media outreach events, um, uh, science and technology demos, <clears throat> but also a number of payload and research activities that we can see there on our screen, including getting to work with the Life Science Glove Box, which I think is amazing. Additionally, we had those technology demos. So Marcus got to interface with uh, robotic crews on ground, as well as some suit demonstrations on orbit. And as we mentioned, this is an opportunity for this crew to understand what it's like to live and work uh, in a microgravity environment. But at the end of their 18 days, they culminated in a short farewell ceremony, which Dragon the crew SpaceX, held. Nose code secured for entry. SpaceX Dragon, what's up? What's really cool about all those things that you mentioned is not only is the crew returning, but there's going to be over 550 pounds of research also returning back to Earth with the crew. Uh, and Dragon makes that possible. Dragon is designed to carry up to seven passengers on the vehicle, but today we only have four crew members, which means that we can use the additional space uh, currently in this configuration, which is underneath the seats of the four crew members, to store cargo. Uh, so they're able to bring uh, a lot of that cargo back with them, back down to Earth. That's fantastic. With all of the mission objectives that they accomplished, it's a significant number of science, uh, a significant amount of science that they can bring back home with them. And so to check out more of that, be sure to check out AxiomSpace.com. Now, we've talked a good bit about what the crew accomplished on station. And we've highlighted some of the research that is returning from space on, uh, from space on this dragon. But we're also big proponents of the arts, right? So it's been 
very easy over time to make the connection between STEM and spaceflight, or science, technology, engineering, and math and spaceflight. But over the last few years, we've been seeing a shift from STEM to STEAM. And on this mission, we were able to actually have a number of pieces of artwork that were placed in space. This is an essential part of exploration, and we wanted to showcase that on this mission. So for this mission, we dedicated space for seven pieces aboard Dragon. And this first piece here is x Not Space Seeker by Dr. Cyan Proctor. Now, she was the pilot on Inspiration4 mission, and this is a metallic spray-painted canvas with a laser-etched x Not hand-painted with golden glitter hues. The next piece is a photo by David Krugman titled Two Seconds, Then Totality. This was taken of the 2018 solar eclipse in Greenbrier, Tennessee. Our third piece is titled Everything You Know and Care About by Amber Vittoria. And our fourth item is a photograph by Richard Zhang titled Infinity. Captured in Joshua Tree National Park, Zhang sought to create a tribute to the stars of the Milky Way that inspired him to dream beyond the limits of Earth. And then we have the soft plush doll Augustus from Mumbot's fictional world. As our sixth piece, we have a cut strip from one of Jack Kaido's earliest physical paintings. Kaido is titled this piece, Past Memories, 2015. And finally, we have Heart and Craft No. 1 by artist Snowfro and Jordan Lyle. Now, all these pieces stayed on board Dragon during the AX3 mission, and through collaboration between Axiom Space, Transient Labs, and Nifty Gateway, each of these pieces have a digital iteration inspired by the flown works available for purchase. For a direct link to the Space Girls collection, visit nft.axiom.com. John, what I think is so cool about this is, you know, tying the arts to science and technology. I think right. people kind of forget that technology is born from the, creati the creative minds of, you know, artists and creators. Um, you know, we're just here trying to bring things to life that people have thought about and, you know, imagined. Um, and I love that we're starting to tie that in a lot more and make an effort to uh, do a lot more art and creativity to drive that technology um, and science. I absolutely agree. It's an essential part of just the human experience. And it's essential that it carries itself into these, you know, these forward missions that we're moving into. You can't have any of this creativity without the artistic creativity behind it. So, you know, this brings to light things like commercial missions, like AX3, Artemis, um, the Artemis mission, and also talking about stations. So regarding the future, like you just mentioned, Jesse, uh, let's talk a little bit about our future of Axiom stations. So let's take a closer look and see how this vision of the future is taking shape. There's sort of two philosophies in aerospace. One is you sit around and you think about requirements and you think about what you want to build. Or you build something, you test it, you figure out what works, you build another generation. We really believe at Axiom Space, the path to building something that doesn't exist in the world is you've got to start building prototypes. We sit and think about what we want to build for a little bit, but then we just go build the thing, test the thing, fire the engine. Our role really is to, to lead the way. A year ago, walking into this facility, you didn't see nearly as much hardware as you see today. Full-scale mock-ups, training hardware, flight hardware, Axiom was created to build a space station, and that, that's exactly what this team is doing. We're still on target to launch our first module the end of 26. The pressure vessel is undergoing welding at Talisalania, our partner in Italy. They're some of the largest forgings in the world. There's only a couple places in Europe that could even forge some of the pieces. The pressure vessel will arrive in Houston, and then we'll do all the final outfitting at our spaceport facility. And in the 50-year history of, of human spaceflight in, in Houston, it will be the first human-rated spacecraft ever built in Houston. Our teams are building all the other things. The life support system, the guidance and navigation, we're building our own propulsion system. Our philosophy is to keep as much engineering in-house as possible. It allows us to have long expertise over a long time because we want to be building modules and adding to our space station for years and years. Through our station, we will open up low Earth orbit to the world to explore, to travel, to complete science in space and beyond. Microgravity represents this enormous natural resource. 
and we think there are things that we can do there that lead to medical breakthroughs, material breakthroughs, and leads to a better world for everyone. It's the ability to produce uh, the highest quality of parts, materials, biological media, in an environment that is nearly pristine. Behind us is uh, the Earth Observatory. We will fly it as part of the third module that goes to the International Space Station. And then the International Space Station robot arm will actually move it and position it underneath HAB-1. So it will have this fantastic view of the Earth through the largest space windows ever attempted. This is as close as you can get to actually doing an EVA in space. We talk about the overview effect where it crews come back and see the world in a different sense than they did before. And I think this is where you can really contemplate that whole experience. AX3 is one of those learning opportunities for a multinational crew to work together in space. This is exactly how we envision Axiom Station to operate, where you have people from all over the world experiencing life as a community in space. Every morning when I walk into this building, I'm inspired by the work this team is completing. It's just a wonderful feeling seeing so many people excited about the prospect of launching the first commercial space station. If we're going to make a sustainable presence outside of the Earth biome, this is how we have to do it. Axiom Space is a continuation of a human need to explore and to move humans into the cosmos. And we heard that call out that we are, have the expected LOS coming up at 5.16 a.m. Uh, in just under 10 minutes from now. Reusability is key to making space, space flight more routine and ultimately what will enable humans to become multi-planetary. The Dragon spacecraft flying today is flight proven. The AX3 Dragon has flown three times on missions to the space station. Its first flight was on NASA's Crew-4 mission in April of 2022. Axiom-3 is the second reflight of this Dragon. There have been 12 Dragon crew missions to date, eight with NASA astronauts and four with private astronaut crews. Dragon unlocks new research opportunities that ultimately impact life on Earth. For us, these Dragon missions are important for safely flying astronauts so that they can conduct science and research and other activities in space, but also because they are laying the foundation for that future where more people from more countries all around the world have an opportunity to travel to space, whether it's low Earth orbit, the moon, Mars, or beyond. In the history of human spaceflight, less than 700 people have ever been to orbit. At SpaceX, we want to help create a future where not just hundreds of people, but thousands and ultimately millions of people can travel off of Earth to live and work in space and other planets. Last year, we flew six Dragon missions. This year, we could launch up to eight missions, including five or six human spaceflight missions, and that's only going to increase in the future. To support our growing manifest of Dragon missions, we've recently made some new upgrades to our other Florida launch pad, Space Launch Complex 40. We're on our way to having two launch pads capable of supporting human spaceflight missions, meaning that we'll have more opportunities for more people to fly on Dragon to orbit. If Interested, if you're interested in helping us advance the future of human spaceflight and potentially fly on a future Dragon mission, check out SpaceX.com to learn more. Now, we are just about seven minutes away from LOS. That is the expected loss of signal or the communication um, uh, signal that we will lose during re-entry. Uh, this will be when, when the plasma begins to build up around the vehicle. That will unfortunately block the communication signal, um, but we will regain that signal with AOS or acquisition of signal about seven minutes after that. Right, Jesse, and like we mentioned earlier, you know, this is a planned aspect of today's mission. You know, it's an expected aspect of today's uh, nominal operations. And so while we're waiting for that loss of signal and then subsequent acquisition of signal, we want to talk through a little bit of a fun list that the teams had put together about this mission, which I think is pretty great. So, you know, off the top, the first five things to know about AX3. First, AX3 represents the first all-European commercial mission to the ISS. Second, Walter became the first astronaut to fly to space under the Italian Air Force flag. Also, Alper, 
became the first astronaut for the country of Turkey. And I think that's fantastic. This is an absolutely wonderful milestone for him and for his country. SpaceX Dragon. All four crew have tablets secured on satchels, restraints tightened, and visors coming down. SpaceX copies on crew configuration. SpaceX copies. Okay, and that's a good call from Commander Michael Lopez Alegria. That crew is getting prepped for their reentry. And on that, Marcus became also the first project astronaut for ESA, and MLA became the first repeat flyer of a SpaceX Dragon. So he's really racking up those miles, which I love. Now, beyond those first, there were a lot of other fun facts. So, for instance, Marcus took with him the Nobel Prize of Swedish author Selma Logilov. Awarded in 1909, Selma was the first woman to ever receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. On a side note, one of her books is an adventure about a boy who rode a goose all over Sweden. And by effect, young readers would learn the geography of the country. So I can definitely see the similarities for Marcus here, who's currently riding a dragon around the world and then communicating back on all the lessons he'll be able to share. Dragon SpaceX, five minutes until predicted calm blackout. See you on the other side at 1323. Copy SpaceX, talk to you soon. Okay, and there we also heard confirmation of an expected LOS time followed by an expected AOS time of 523 Pacific Time AM. Continuing on with MLA, a highlight of his trip here was able to speak with, being able to speak with his alma mater, the U.S. Naval Academy, where he took questions from Kerr Midshipman. And in just over 18 days docked to the ISS and an anticipated total mission duration of 23 flight days, this mission now holds the record for the longest Axiom space mission, eclipsing the previous record set by AX-1 in 2022. This crew also conducted a total of 28 interactive outreach and media events, including nine events with students around the world. But beyond that, Alper had a conversation with the president of Turkey. Walter engaged with the Italian prime minister. Marcus spoke at the European Space Conference and MLA spoke with Melissa Navia from Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Also, the AX3 astronauts performed 56 different experiments, including studying metastatic breast cancer organoids for the Stanford Stem Cell Institute. And we were told the crew was able to see microgravity-induced changes in organoid growth versus how they grow on ground. That is a very long list yeah. of <laughs> things that this, this crew did on board the International Space Station, but all really awesome. It's, it's great to see that they also incorpor incorporated some outreach events oh, yeah. throughout all their science experiments that they had to do while they were working there. So just incredible crew. Oh, yeah. It was an amazing mission. They accomplished all their mission objectives from media outreach, like you mentioned, Jesse, to all of the science research that was done and to be able to come back and say, we did it all. That's an amazing feat. And this, like we mentioned at the beginning, this is a mission of first for so many, for so many countries, for so many agencies. Um, but there's one crew member that we have not gotten to talk about, and she's on board, and her name is Gigi. She is a critical, critical crew member and aspect of the mission. So that's right. Our fifth crew member is our microgravity indicator, Gigi. This is a long-standing tradition in spaceflight and was continued on AX3. And this tradition is having an indicator inside the spacecraft to provide a visual reference for when the crew has reached weightlessness. Uh, so as the fifth crew member of AX2 and now AX3, the Gigi's mission is to inspire children around the world to learn about space. Gigi is a Build-A-Bear teddy bear wearing Axiom's Axiom U spacesuit, just like the ones we are currently building for NASA astronauts to wear on future Artemis missions to the moon. You can get your own full-size, flight-ready Build-A-Bear crew member for all your missions at home. As you can see, she's ready for every adventure. <laughs> the zero-G indicator is one of my favorite yeah. parts of, of crew missions, so very awesome to see Gigi on board with the crew. Mm -hmm. And speaking of spacesuits, um, the spacesuits are very unique uh, and custom designed, and you can see there on your screen. Um, they have a 3D printed hel helmet, and this is actually all a single piece. Uh, everything is connected together. This, the suit with the helmet is all a single piece, um, and this 
suit is actually made to fit with the seat. So these are custom suits to the astronauts, but also the suits and the the, the suits and the seats are customized uh, to match each other. Um, and they're really uh, an extension of the Dragon spacecraft. Um, they essentially can provide, you know, nitrox and uh, cooling just as the cabin capsule of the Dragon spacecraft. Um, so very cool, very unique uh, spacesuits that we have here. Yeah, and I think those suits like really highlight an essential element kind of of what is making days like today, days like launch, um, and you know, flying these missions so important. It's the attention paid to the crew. You know, it's it's an autonomous vehicle, but you're going to be on a as we saw on AX3. There, they right? had a very long uphill. They have a very long downhill. You want to be comfortable during that, um, and those suits demonstrate that ability to, you know, get crew comfortable, um, have their have it customized to their to their bodies. Um, uh, for their for their mission, and I think just the self the suit itself, like you said, it's not only looks cool, but it's incredibly functional. <laughs> exactly. And speaking of functional, we are just about uh, under a minute away from that expected loss of signal. Um, so the crew will be going through this blackout period here uh, for about seven minutes. Again, it's expected. This is the plasma building up around the vehicle as it's heating up. It's getting to about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so we will uh, continue to check in with the, the crew. The um, core will continue to check in once we have, uh, once we're at about 5.23 a.m. Um, and have that expected acquisition of signal. You may hear some comms uh, of the core calling out to the crew just to check to see when we do have that connection again. Right, and you know, we, we mentioned earlier, this is a very dynamic day. There's a lot of elements through the day that carry us from, you know, we already experienced undocking a few days ago, but, um, but from basically the moment that they've committed now to deorbit and reentry, from here on out, it really is paying attention to these timeline events, the loss of signal that is expected, um, the acquisition of signal that we have a, a known time to be pinging crew and, and seeing how they're doing, followed immediately by a lot of very dynamic back-to-back -back events, right? We're looking for the drogue parachutes to deploy. Uh, we're looking for visual confirmation of the vehicle coming in, um, and then ultimately followed by splashdown and recovery. It's gonna be a very dynamic day. Yeah, it's getting really exciting. We're just under 15 minutes from their splashdown. The crew has been in space uh, for about 23 days or so. Um, and, you know, they're, they're almost back home on Earth. Uh, again, if you're just now joining us at this point, we are in the communications blackout period, which is expected to last approximately seven minutes due to the plasma formation around the spacecraft. During this time, no vehicle telemetry is received by mission control or the recovery team, and no external commanding of the vehicle or voice communications is possible. As a reminder, Dragon is designed to fly itself and continues to autonomously use Draco thrusters to orient itself during reentry. During reentry, the vehicle will be slowing down from orbital velocity, which is approximately 17,500 miles per hour. The top temperature Dragon will experience upon reentry is about 3,500 degrees. Um, so it is experiencing some really high heat. We did talk about, you know, the suits um, being an extension of that spacecraft. The cabin capsule, uh, the capsule cabin is being cooled with nitrox, but also the suits are also being cooled with nitrox. And this is to help keep the crew comfortable as they're going through this very hot period of time. Uh, again, that's 3,500 degrees on the outside of the vehicle. So they might start to feel a little bit of that on the inside of the cabin, but that is what the flowing of nitrox is for, is to keep the cabin cool while it's going through this hot period. Right, and you know, it's a, it, it, it highlights an essential element of what you need for today, right? That, that, that flight suit is a very critical element for their trip home, and so keeping them not only comfortable, um, but also just that physiology um, in check, that life support system, it's doing its work with that nitrox, like you said, to keep them cool, keep them comfortable, um, and it is an extension of the vehicle. Um, but with that, with that type of dynamic day, it's very critical that that suit is performing its function, and we're looking forward to getting crew home at the end of this. Yeah, we still have about four minutes left in this blackout period. Um, and the crew is expected to splash down on the Atlantic side of the Florida Panhandle um, off the coast of Daytona, Florida. 
Um, and we do have our recovery vessel Shannon on that side of Florida, uh, which will, which is currently waiting for the crew to splash down and will begin its their uh, recovery operations to recover the crew. Once they splash down in the ocean, uh, we will do some safety checks, but then the recovery crew will start to make their way to the capsule and start performing recovery operations. Right. Yeah, and at this point, you know, during this blackout, like we said, when we come to acquisition of signal, there's certain things that we're looking for. And one of those is definitely going to be a visual cue of that vehicle coming back in, followed by other visual cues like uh, the drogue chutes deploying um, and then followed by those main chutes. And I think that's a really cool, it's a really cool system, but it's also very essential to get that crew going or that the vehicle moving from the speed that it's moving down to another comfortable phase. It's like a staged approach to get them to a comfortable landing so that Shannon can go and perform safe recovery and greeting operations. Yeah, I actually think it's pretty incredible that, you know, while you're in orbit, you're traveling 17,500 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. um, but throughout this seven, seven minute period of reentry, it is slowing down the vehicle so much down to 350 miles per hour. That is a, an extreme um, uh, slowdown in such a short period of time. Right. Um, and then the drogue and the main parachutes also keep the vehicle safe. It, it helps slow the vehicle down even more um, so that the vehicle can, can touch down softly on, uh, on the ocean. Right, and then once it does, you know, those parachutes are jettisoned essentially, and those are gonna be recovered by other vehicles. So again, as part of kind of that, the operations of what today is going to look like after splashdown, it's still gonna be very dynamic. There's still gonna be a lot of activity on the ground to ensure that uh, we're safely approaching crew, that we're keeping them safe, um, but that also we are making as swift contact as we can to ensure that, you know, now that they have traveled from 17,500 all the way down, coming back, and there you can see the recovery vessel, uh, a live shot of that. Um, we're gonna see a bit more of that later today. And we are just about a minute away from the expected acquisition of signal. Again, we are currently in a blackout period. Um, once we reach the point of uh, expected AOS, uh, the core will begin to call out to the crew to establish communication once again. So we may start hearing those call outs here shortly. Um, but again, still in the in the blackout period, but expected to come out of that in just about a minute. Exactly right. And you can see there on your screen, MCC uh, X in, in Hawthorne here in California, uh, as well as MCC A in Houston, Texas, are constantly monitoring the situation that we have um, uh, uh, for crew coming back down. They are uh, supporting crew throughout this Dragon entire- SpaceX, comm check. Loud and clear, SpaceX. Loud and clear as well. Expect automated chute deployment. Copy, Arthur. And we did hear that call out that we have confirmation of acquisition of signal. And you can see on your screen a live view of the AX3 crew inside of Dragon Freedom. Now we're just about three minutes away from drogue parachute deployment. And there you can see a live view from the ground watching Dragon as it's re making its way back down to Earth, which is a really awesome view there. <laughs> yeah, this is a beautiful example of exactly what we were just talking about during, uh, during the loss of comms phase. Upon acquisition of signal, we are looking for good comm checks with the crew, which we got, and visual confirmation of the vehicle, which we got. Dragon SpaceX, GPS has converged. Expect nominal drogue deploy altitude. Copy, SpaceX. good comms between the core and the crew. And again, we are just a couple minutes away from drug parachutes deploying. And just under a minute after the drug parachutes deploy. Oh, and, and currently you can see on your screen that they are reconfiguring their seats. So you can see that the seats are rotating down and that is happening live right now in preparation for splashdown. 
Got brace for drogue window. And looked like the seat rotation was completed and now they are ready for those drogue parachutes to deploy. What you're seeing on your screen is a live view of the Dragon capsule returning back to Earth. And there you can see the drogue parachutes have deployed and a cool view from the capsule itself. Shortly after, we should see the four main chutes deploy here. Visual on two healthy drogues and descent rate nominal. And excellent call outs there. You see the same marker. And we do have com visual confirmation that the drogues have deployed. Now, just waiting for the four main parachutes to deploy as well. And there you can see on your screen. Four mains have deployed. They will begin to slowly open up and help slow the vehicle, vehicle down. The vehicle is approximately moving at 119 miles per hour and the main chutes deployed at 6,500 feet. And there's an awesome view from the capsule itself looking up at the four Visual main chutes. Four healthy mains and sh descent rate nominal. Copy, we show ourselves at 1,000 meters. Copy, 1,000. Got some good call outs there. And just a few minutes away from the Axiom 3 crew splashing down back on Earth here. SpaceX Dragon, 800 meters. Copy, 800. And what you're hearing is call-outs of the ground and the crew on board monitoring the altitude of the vehicle and the crew as they're making their way back down to Earth. Six hundred meters. And we're just a couple minutes away from splashdown. Landing in water is simpler, therefore more reliable than uh, landing on land. And there you can see an awesome view. It's beautiful. <laughs> the Dragon capsule, Dragon Freedom, carrying AX3 as it's 400. slowly making its way to splashdown. Now, these are absolutely fantastic views that we got um, at acquisition of Signal, Jesse. It was incredible coming back from AOS to see those good comm checks, those good visual confirmations of the vehicle coming in, and then the visual confirmations of the first drogue shoots, which deployed beautifully, and followed by the main shoots. And additionally, we got to see crew even rotate their seats to prepare for splashdown. All of these are 200 crew braced for splashdown. Copy, braced for splashdown. Splashdown. Copy splashdown. We are with you in 4.800. Copy. Copy 
and an excellent sight to see. Welcome home, AX3. Arthur, all the observations from As you can see on your screen, we have visual confirmation of splashdown of the Dragon spacecraft. Dragon Freedom has returned home with the AX3 crew. Dragon SpaceX, can you repeat your last call at cut out for post splashdown observations? Nominal. Copy nominal. Some excellent views of the Dragon capsule there. The SpaceX recovery ship and team have been waiting for Dragon splashdown, and they will now begin to make their way to the splashdown SpaceX location. Confirm environmental assessment is not necessary. SpaceX confirms not necessary. Some good comms there. The teams have been ready and waiting about three nautical miles away, so it's going to take them about 30 minutes to make their way to our crew inside of Dragon. And once they do approach, they will do uh, some quick safety checks uh, to make sure that it is safe for the crew to egress the Dragon vehicle. Then they will begin to um, to uh, prepare the Dragon capsule to be lifted back on or onto the recovery ship, um, which they will then open the hatch and the crew can egress from the Dragon capsule. These are some great daytime views of Dragon splashdown. AX Three crew still inside of the Dragon capsule, waiting for their recovery vessel, Shannon, uh, and recovery crew to come pick them up. Yeah, this has been an absolutely picture-perfect splashdown, and these views are really highlighting that. Um, and it's not just beautiful, it's, it's an essential tool for ensuring that we keep eyes on this Dragon, right? Um, and, but you can't deny that being able to watch uh, get confirmation of parachute deploy, get visual confirmation of the vehicle coming in, and then seeing that landing, in addition to commander's uh, calls down to crew, um, all painted a wonderful example of a lockstep uh, um, splashdown day. And it's been absolutely fantastic. And you can see uh, Dragon sitting there in the Atlantic uh, with, with chutes deployed and crew is comfortable and safe and healthy, and they are waiting now for Shannon to make first contact to begin the, uh, the recovery operations. It can be, again, like we mentioned earlier, a lot of dynamic aspects uh, over the next 30 minutes as crew makes their way, as, as ground crews make their way to, to Dragon, uh, and then as they begin to prep Dragon for hoisting it into the vehicle. And you could also see in the background, the camera has now tilted away, but you could see Shannon and uh, two fast boats making their way towards the Dragon capsule, the recovery team on their way to help the crew. Uh, Dragon SpaceX, SpaceX is go for recovery personnel to approach. Expect personnel alongside in approximately one minute. And on behalf of SpaceX, welcome home. Thanks for flying SpaceX. Flying SpaceX was our pleasure, and one minute to the operation. Speaking of fast boats, that yeah. was pretty fast. <laughs> They're just about a minute away, and you can see them that now there live on the screen, the fast boats approaching very quickly. Yeah, and like you said, it's, it, was, it was faster than anticipated, but it's an example of when you have teams prepped and you have... Um, you, you've done your homework to know where crew's coming back. It's an example of how uh, Axiom and SpaceX are ready for, to receive their crew um, uh, back on land. And you can see the recovery crew now getting close to approaching the Dragon Freedom spacecraft. Now, Dragon 
has already autonomous, autonomously completed some of the safety inspections um, following splashdown, and now the recovery team will also perform a few safety checks just to make sure. Dragon SpaceX requests permission to come aboard via the display camera view only. You can come come aboard, Arthur, and just for your essay, all four crew members are feeling well. SpaceX copies, great news. Sounds like we might get a view inside of the Dragon capsule at our crew. And there you can see the recovery team reaching out to Dragon. They will actually climb onto the Dragon capsule, perform some safety checks to make sure that it is safe for the vehicle, for the crew members inside of the vehicle to egress. Um, and then begin operations to prepare the capsule to be lifted back onto the, not back onto the recovery ship, but onto the recovery vessel um, once the recovery vessel is there. Exactly right, Jesse. And, and with that call um, to the crew on Dragon, with a great live view there of, of inside the a Dragon Freedom capsule. Um, we heard MLA call that all four crew members are feeling good. They're feeling well, they're feeling healthy. So this is fantastic. That first fast boat made good initial contact and like you mentioned, is ready to kind of press into the next phase of operations here as we pull that Dragon back into the, into the recovery vessel. You can also see on your screen the, the second fast boat, um, which provides redundant support to the primary, to the primary uh, uh, fast boat, which made initial contact, um, in addition to helping just keep, those, keep that area secure, right? Um, redundancy is a key aspect of space flight operations, not only uh, on ground and in orbit, but also during recovery. In addition to that recovery, they're also working on that parachute recovery. So we saw them, we saw that Dragon had jettisoned its its parachutes after deployment and after uh, after splashdown. And this fast boat, as well as uh, another another jet ski, are helping to uh, recover that parachute to again keep that area secure to not inhibit any operations that um, that are going to be underway while that while that primary fast boat's making contact and doing its work, but also while Shannon's coming up right behind them. There's that jet ski passing by. <laughs> Part of the recovery team. Mm -hmm. And again, what you're seeing here is a live view of the AX-3 crew inside of Dragon Freedom, now splashed down on Earth. The recovery team is performing their recovery operations. Again, just waiting for them to perform some safety checks. We did get some good comms earlier that the crew is feeling good after Splashdown. Mm -hmm. They had a pretty dynamic adventure this morning. And now hopefully get to relax exactly. a little bit while they're you know, waiting for the Dragon lift onto the recovery vehicle. Right. Right, dynamic, but completely according to plan. It was a beautiful execution of a of a splashdown day, and you can you can tell there, crew is visors up. They are looking they are looking healthy and happy, and I think they're probably really looking forward to that first breath of fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> If you're just now joining us, the AX-3 crew has returned from space after being in space for about 21 days. 
They undocked from the International Space Station a couple of days ago and are now back on Earth. The recovery crew, again, performing their recovery operations. These are standard procedures. They're currently making sure that the vehicle is safe. Then we should see uh, one of the crew members up on board the Dragon capsule and begin operations to prepare the capsule for lifting onto the recovery vessel. This is an excellent side-by-side -side view showing on, you know, basically this is still the dynamic phase of, of operations, right? Crews splash down, they're safe and healthy, their visors up. Um, but at the same time, everybody still has a job to do. So on the right, you can still see crew inside the capsule looking over the shoulders of Commander Michael Lopez Alegria and Pilot Walter Villaday as they monitor their, their vehicle systems uh, and stay in contact with, uh, with ground crews here, with CORE at SpaceX. And then on the left, you can see as, uh, as the primary fast boat has made first contact, um, an initial contact with the, with the Dragon Freedom after its splashdown coming in from space. And at this point, they are maintaining that contact and just ensuring that the, that the area is safe, that the vehicle is safe to continue those hoisting operations. So I love being able to see these views side by side um, to help everybody maintain that awareness exactly of what's going on outside the vehicle, but also in. There you can see on your screen that the recovery crew member there is doing some checks, some ordinance and hypergol checks at the moment. Again, making sure that the vehicle is safe to approach, then they can climb onto the capsule, begin rigging operations and prepare the vehicle to be lifted onto the recovery vessel today is Shannon. Uh, Shannon is making its way to the recovery zone here, um, but these fast boats, uh, and we did see a jet ski also with the crew, make their way a little bit faster and get the recovery process started sooner until the recovery vessel makes its way to the landing zone. What you're seeing is a live view of the AX3 crew inside of Dragon Freedom. 
patiently waiting for their recovery operations. They've made their way back down to earth and the recovery team is working their standard procedures in preparation for lifting the capsule out of the water and onto the recovery vessel and then eventually will egress the crew for the first time in about three weeks. Yeah. Yeah, at this point we're waiting for those ordnance and hypergold checks to complete. Dragon SpaceX, hypergold sweeps, and unfired ordnance checks nominal, rigging in progress. Approximately two five minutes until capsule lift. Stand by for PMC with SpaceX flight surgeon. Copy all our stand standby. And almost on call, <laughs> that, was a, that was an excellent call from Crew to Dragon um, saying that the Hypergall checks are complete and the ordnance checks are complete and they all completed nominal. So with that, we were able to proceed to the next phase of the dynamic operations, which allows um, uh, rigging to begin so that we can hoist uh, Dragon Freedom into Shannon. And we also heard there that Crew will be having their, um, uh, their PMC or um, private medical, medical conference with, uh, with SpaceX, um, uh, with SpaceX Medical and um, just checking in on crew. But as we reported earlier, or as MLA reported earlier, this crew's feeling healthy and happy to be home. Um, their visors are up, they are monitoring their systems, and over the next 25 minutes, we should be able to get them on board. And there you can see on your screen our recovery vessel, Shannon, patiently waiting for the crew and capsule to be ready for lifting onto the recovery vessel. You can also see on Shannon there is that landing pad there. That's because a helicopter is going to come and uh, take the astronauts or the, the crew back to land um, that's a much faster trip than, you know, taking the recovery vessel all the way back to shore. Um, so that's what that landing pad is for. That's right. If you're just joining us, Axiom 3 crew has splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean at 5.30 a.m. Pacific time or 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. And at this point, we are uh, we are waiting for that recovery, uh, the recovery efforts to continue. Um, uh, SpaceX teams made first contact uh, with the Dragon with the Dragon Freedom uh, capsule and crew. Crew reported all nominal uh, nominal health checks. They're feeling good and excited to be home. And at this point, we are waiting for the, those rigging operations to continue to get Dragon onto Shannon, that recovery vessel, so that they can have their final medical checks and get on that helicopter and get back home, get back to land. Yeah, I'm sure the crew is pretty excited to be back home, mm -hmm. pretty excited to take a breath of fresh air, as exactly. you mentioned. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Right, excited to be home after, you know, the three weeks in orbit, right? 23 flight days, 21 days, 18 days aboard the International Space Station where they accomplished a suite of activities. Dragon. Dragon SpaceX comm check on Dragon to Ground Public.
clear. And Dragon, you're coming in choppy. Uh, we have pretty ready comm right now, uh, so we're going to take some steps to reconfigure Dragon Communications before we step into the PMC. Copy, SpaceX. Some comms between the core, the crew, operations and resources engineer to the crew. And what you're seeing on your screen is the recovery team, again, a crew member on the capsule, beginning rigging for preparation of lifting the capsule out of the water and onto the recovery vessel. This is really great that we've, we had a daytime splashdown. We're getting some really excellent views yeah. of all of these operations happening. It's a beautiful early morning for a splashdown. The weather's looking fantastic. The, uh, the local environment is looking fantastic for crews to, to perform these operations, right? We mentioned earlier that this is really a safety critical aspect of the mission. Um, and one that's important to note that uh, we talked about training earlier too. And this aspect of the mission is something that these crews train for heavily. Um, this fast boat recovery team, the entire recovery team efforts, all train for their specific roles in today's operations like this. And when the weather is, is playing nominally with you like this, it allows for that to execute quite well. Um, and so we're able to see these teams really execute kind of a, a, a picture perfect recovery effort. Rigging is going uh, smoothly. Um, and they're, they're progressing well into it at this point, and we're waiting for those next steps to um, be able to hoist Dragon into Shannon. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, training for these operations. You know, throughout this entire mission, everybody's following standard procedures. The, the crew has tablets inside of the capsule with them where they can follow, you know, their procedures, basically their instructions. Mm -hmm. And the recovery team does the same thing. Yeah. They're following very standard procedures, going step by step um, and making sure that they perform every step carefully and having verification of each one of those steps. So while it may look like they're just doing their work, they're actually, you know, following very uh, specific instructions. Exactly. And again, what you're seeing on your screen is a recovery crew member on board of the Dragon capsule rigging the vehicle in preparation for lifting onto or hoisting onto the recovery vessel. And honestly, the recovery team must be just as excited as the crew. They're going to be the first people oh, you're absolutely right. that they get to see right. when they egress the Dragon capsule. So this is a really special, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure the recovery crew, you know, probably really enjoys their job. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, to play such a pivotal role in, in these operations, right? Crew has been, um, you know, from launch until now, they've been away from their, from their friends and family and away from Earth. And to be, the, to be that crew that helps greet them and ensure that they're, that they're safely brought in, right? Mm -hmm. Following the procedures, doing your job to make sure that this crew is getting uh, safely, safely brought out of the water and into the vehicle and then be able to see them smile and see everybody smile at the end of it. That's got to be a wonderful feeling. Yeah, I can't, I can't even imagine how exciting that must be. Again, a live view inside of the Dragon Freedom capsule with our crew members of the AX3 crew.
and there's a view of the recovery vessel. That is where the dragon will be lifted out of the water and will sit in that little nest that you see there, um, that ring uh, on the vessel. I think it's a perfect name for holding a dragon. <laughs> Exactly. That was intentional, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but right, it's a, it's a great view that kind of, you know, to me signifies what Shannon's role in this operation is, right? Right now it's sitting and waiting while making approach, uh, while the primary contact team is ensuring that that rigging is, um, you know, uh, executed uh, properly, but then also verified and checked, um, as, like, as you mentioned, part of the procedures, prior to performing the hoist operation to get Dragon into its comfortable nest. Um, and at that point, at, at that point, we have additional crew members, like you said, that we're going to be very excited to get this to get this dragon uh, on board. But it takes time, and we got we've got to go a little slow because slow is smooth, and then smooth is fast, and that allows us to get to get crew on board. Yeah, and once dragon is in that nest, um, we saw that it was uh, near the end uh, of the ship. It will actually slide forward uh, to position itself next to a platform. Uh, which will be level with the hatch. So when they open the hatch, the astronauts can egress uh, comfortably out of the Dragon capsule there. Excellent service. <laughs> and that is a beautiful shot if you're just tuning in uh, to see Shannon, the recovery vessel, um, SpaceX's recovery vessel in the Atlantic, ready to, um, to meet and greet and hoist the AX-3 crew um, upon their splashdown today off the coast of Florida. And for those wondering what this landing pad is for, again, once the crew egresses the vehicle, they will, uh, you know, do some self, uh, safety and health checks to make sure that the crew uh, is healthy. But then they'll board a helicopter that's going to land on that landing pad that will take them back to land uh, pretty quickly. So they've got some great service, as you yeah. mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> and what's excellent about this view, too, is you can really see a lot of uh, aspects of these operations kind of play out. Dragon SpaceX, com check. Loud and clear, SpaceX, copy. Copy, we have you the same. Uh, we are transmitting through uh, Shannon recovery vessel now, uh, and with this, I'm going to try and set up the quick PMC with flight surgeon. Okay, standing by. Hearing a little bit of calm there between Core and Commander Lopez Alegria uh, on Dragon Freedom, uh, waiting to establish some some communications so that they can uh, talk with SpaceX medical surgeon. Um, but during that time, uh, crews are crews on ground or in the water actually are, are continuing to make operations uh, or proceed through operations to uh, prepare Dragon for a uh, hoist into the recovery vessel Shannon. So you can see on your left there, the initial fast boat that made, uh, made initial recovery and, and proceeded through rigging operations for the Dragon spacecraft. Um, and the recovery vessel Shannon nearing or making closer approach to, uh, to Dragon to begin the hoisting operations.
There you can see, as John mentioned, the recovery vessel is now beginning to pull the Dragon capsule towards it. Dragon SpaceX, we are back on Dragon to Ground Public. Loud and clear. I think what's amazing about this shot, Jesse, is it 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 looks like it's all so simple, <laughs> and the the care and precision that has to go into this operation from all of the teams that you see um, that really that you can't even see in this shot that are supporting this type of operation uh, is is amazing to allow for that for that um, hydraulic lift now to come down and begin this hoisting operation. Um, all of this was a very tightly choreographed dance to get us to this point, and it's really exciting to see us getting here to where we're about to hoist Dragon into the nest. Yeah, exactly. It may look easy, but yeah. it is, you know, a lot of training, a lot of effort, yeah. a lot of planning goes yes. into these operations. And as you said, very exciting. The hydraulic lift is now down, and they will begin to start to lift the Dragon capsule here shortly. We'll lift the capsule onto the deck of the recovery vessel into the nest that you see there. That's that circular uh, ring there on the deck. And again, once the Dragon capsule is seated. Dragon SpaceX, approximately five minutes until capsule lift. We copy SpaceX. Good update there, just about five minutes away from lift. Again, once the capsule is in that nest on the deck, that nest will actually slide forward to put Dragon next to a platform uh, that will make it much easier for the crew to egress the Dragon capsule. Right, and once they egress, they'll be greeted by, uh, by SpaceX and Axiom medical, uh, medical professionals to just ensure that, you know, hey, we just want to make sure you're doing okay, everything's going all right, do those first initial checks, and then at that point, crew is able to to step out and take their first steps too for <laughs> the first the first steps in a number of weeks. Yeah, very very exciting. Again, very cool that the crew on board this recovery vessel gets to be the first to greet the crew after they've been in space for a few weeks. Dragon SpaceX brace for capsule lift. Bracing. And a nice big jump into the ocean for the recovery <laughs> crew, completing their rigging operations. And Dragon Freedom being lifted onto recovery vessel Shannon. I love that they mentioned to brace for the lift. Yeah. <laughs> you could see that the vehicle is, is moving and swaying a little bit, yeah. but I'm sure it's it was nothing compared to re-entry. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. My crew's had a lot of dynamic operations associated with today, and this is one of the final ones. There's a few more that have to go into play before they're back on land, um, but this, this moment of getting them finally back out of the water and into this nest situated while they're comfortable um, is a wonderful moment for the AX3 crew.
And a great choreographed lift there. Gently setting down the dragon yeah. capsule onto the nest. It's important for this point too, right after that lift, to kind of orient it just right so that it's ready for that translation maneuver you talked about, um, while also ensuring that you know crew is staying in a comfortable, well-oriented position so that uh, egress operations are as smooth as they can be. Yeah, this gives you a good view of that hatch that the crew is going to egress from. Um, you can see that it's pretty much in the middle of the capsule. So moving it towards the platform, that platform will be just at the bottom of that hatch. And that hatch has been closed mm -hmm. since they left Earth. Mm -hmm. Dragon SpaceX, welcome aboard the recovery vessel. Recovery personnel are completing final checks. Stand by for translation to the egress platform. SpaceX Dragon, we copy. Good calls there between CORE and Commander Lopez Alegria to confirm that uh, crew is that we are preparing to um, uh, to press into the egress phase of today's operations. Um, but yeah, Jesse, you mentioned that that side hatch that they'll be coming out of hasn't been opened uh, in a number of weeks, um, and that's because when they're when they're on orbit, right? They're using the they're using the uh, the hatch that's under that nose cone, um, the docking hatch to to translate between their vehicle and ISS. So once they once they close that door on launch day, it doesn't open until today. And the, I'm sure the crew is very excited for that side hatch to open. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We did hear some comms talking about this, but the crew, the recovery crew there is doing some last safety checks. Now that the vehicle is on the deck of the recovery vessel prior to the translation motion of moving the capsule towards the egress platform. Live view inside of the capsule that is on the recovery vessel with the crew still inside, patiently waiting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. If you're just joining us, we're in the final phases of the recovery of the splashdown of the AX3 crew, which splashed down back to Earth earlier today at 530 uh, a.m. Pacific time or 8.30 a.m. Eastern time off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we're in those final phases of recovery um, uh, recovery efforts, which is the next step up being hatch open. So this will be the first time that crew has 
uh, exited that side hatch in uh, over three weeks, um, or about three weeks, or 23 flight days and 21 days in space. Crew is currently in the Dragon uh, vehicle, but on board the recovery vessel Shannon, as uh, uh, ground crews are still preparing some final, some final tweaks um, and preparations to to translate to translate the vehicle um, into a position that crew can egress. If you're just now joining us, you are watching live coverage of the AX3 splashdown and recovery currently in progress. On your left hand screen, you could see that the Dragon capsule, Dragon Freedom, is on board our recovery vessel, Shannon. The recovery crew is doing their final checks prior to the translation of the capsule towards the egress platform. The next event coming up will be side hatch opening up and that will be the first time that the hatch will be opened since launch day and the A axiom 3 crew will take their first breath of fresh air since boarding falcon 9 at the start of their mission on january 18th You can see the crew live on your right hand screen inside of the dragon capsule again patiently waiting Mm -hmm. All right, ground crews are still walking through their procedural checks and verifications to ensure that Dragon is in a safe position to translate, and it looks like they have made that call. So you can see Dragon there translating now. Very exciting. I'm sure the crew can feel that movement, <laughs> and they're getting really excited for that hatch to open. <laughs> There's that egress platform that we've been mentioning. You can see the recovery crew there just preparing the vehicle in preparation for that side hatch opening. And a good view inside of Dragon. We have the commander on the left-hand side, pilot on the right-hand side. You can see the displays there. Dragon SpaceX, ground team is making final preps for hatch open. Stand by for side hatch opening. Standing by.
And you can see those displays right behind that display is the hatch, and that is what the crew is looking at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as soon as that side hatch opens, the crew will be able to see the recovery crew exactly. and the medical crew there waiting there for them. Right, and these are those initial checks that we talked about. The the first people that these that the crew is greeted by is by the medical the medical teams too, just to ensure that they're that they're doing well um, uh, after their flight and after their, their return home. Um, and they'll make they'll make some medical assessments and make sure they're okay. And at that point, crew is egressing the vehicle and onto that helicopter ride back home. And there is the hatch opening. Welcome home, crew of AX3. Now that that side hatch is open, they are going to put a protective tool there to ensure that the crew uh, is safe when they egress the vehicle. And their first human interaction with mm -hmm. someone from Earth <laughs> <laughs> in the last three weeks. <laughs> It's a great example of even even in this moment, right? The hatch is opened, crew is ready to get out. We're still taking our time to make sure that they're okay, um, that everything on board is uh, as it should be. And at that point, we'll begin um, crew one by one, leaving leaving the uh, their Dragon Freedom vehicle. And this again is a, a standard procedure. Um, even when they're getting up out of their seats, it's very important that they are very careful. They've yeah. been in space for um, quite a while. Yeah. Um, and so the, the crew there will also, you know, help them if the, if the crew needs help, make sure that they're healthy and safe as they're egressing through that side hatch. Exactly. It can be, you know, a little bit um, different when you've been in space for a few, a few, uh, a few days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, no experiencing gravity. microgravity. <laughs> um, so exactly right. That that type of assistance, um, you know, if needed, um, is is there and able to and, and able to be provided a support. <laughs> that is an amazing view of the AX3 crew waving, smiling, of course, <laughs> as they have been since launch day on January 18th. Some great waves. You can see their very excited <laughs> faces there. <laughs> that was, that was a, awesome. That was a wonderful <laughs> shot. That was a wonderful shot. Getting thumbs up there between ground crews and commander. Now, as we mentioned earlier, this is you know MLA's second uh, second trip on the on the AX um, on on Crew Dragon uh, for an uh, for an Axiom mission. So he's he's aware of this this process and this procedure. I'm sure he's telling his crew. Hey guys, we're gonna take our time. <laughs> and it looks like they are ready to proceed with egress.
Yes, you could see MLA removing his harness. Again, frequent flyer, yeah. as you've mentioned, yeah. our first frequent flyer on Dragon. Super exciting. Maybe so he'll get to put a sticker on the, on right, the, on right. the inside <laughs> of the capsule. <laughs> And you can see there that they've installed basically a protective tool around the hatch, the side hatch, as well as a little bit of a ramp there so that the, the crew can safely egress. They are still in their suits and also need to protect uh, the suits themselves. Uh, so we will make sure that the, the suits do not get damaged as they're egressing. You'll see that the crew, the recovery crew there will help them exit, may put their hand over their helmet just to make sure that they don't bump their head. And there's a few people there yeah. to help them, which is great. Right, and, and like we mentioned, this is their this is their first moment back on Earth, and over in 23 days, <laughs> gravity is going to be uh, a familiar but uh, <laughs> a reminder of an experience. And so, coming out of this hatch, you know, it's um, it may it may seem and look simple, uh, but there are some nuances associated with it. With wearing that suit um, that you want to protect for, with also protecting for just your mobility, um, coming back from uh, from this from this um, mission with its extent, um, with its mission duration, um, you certainly want to be aware of of their first time back in gravity in a while. So so all of those translation aids really really help ensure that when they're getting out of the vehicle, they're doing it as safely as possible, but also as comfortably as they as we can let them. Yeah, exactly. And as we mentioned, you know, the the side hatch is open, but they're not running out of their seats, right? right? They're taking, right. Uh, it is step by step, removing the harnesses. They did remove uh, some of the, the feet rests um, at the bottom of their seats. All of these things to make it easier for them to exit the vehicle. Because at the end of the day, with all of this, you want to make sure that you're you're comfortably getting out of the vehicle. And we saw their ground crews reminding, uh, reminding crew, hey, just might, might, might want to close that visor just to be safe. Um, and to watch their, you know, watch their head as exactly. they're getting out of their seat. Exactly. Yeah. And we see the pilot making his way out of his seat or in about to egress the vehicle. So Walter Day will be taking his first steps in 23 days on Earth. We can see Walter coming <laughs> out of Dragon, having some assistance from ground crews. Visor up. Awesome. And, I, and I do think I see a smile on that face. <laughs> yeah. And a wave, a wave and a thumbs up. Walter is feeling good. Welcome home, Walter Villade.
If you're just now joining us, we are watching the live egress of the Axiom 3 crew. And you can see that Marcus Want, our mission specialist coming out of seat four, is getting ready to egress the Dragon Freedom capsule. This will be Marcus's first steps in gravity in 23 flight days, 21 days in space and 18 days aboard the International Space Station. So we're taking our time and making sure that he is comfortable and making sure that he's going to be safely egressing the vehicle. Welcome home, Marcus. And again, visor up, and I think, of course, we're going to see Marcus smiling. Yeah, we are. Okay. There we go. Some waves. <laughs> Giving his wave. Marcus is feeling good. This is excellent to see. Crew's going to assist as we take those first steps back in gravity. <laughs> And our third egress of the day, we have Alper Izarache, the first Turkish astronaut to fly to space. Alper is looking good. He's excited. He's excited. He's ecstatic. He's happy to be home. He's given excellent smiles and a great fist bump there. I love to see that. And last, but definitely not least, our frequent flyer, Commander Michael Lopez Alegria. And even with that <laughs> frequent flyer card, MLA is no stranger to this maneuver, but he is also taking his time and he is looking good. And welcome back, MLA. <laughs> Excellent. It is wonderful to see all four crew members of AX3 egress comfortably and safely uh, out of the Dragon, uh, the Dragon Freedom that they've spent their time in for the last two days, certainly, um, but also just a number of a number of days on this mission. Um, but they're looking good. They're looking healthy, and it was wonderful to see. So. Well, now that our crew are safely back home on Earth and getting the first checks by SpaceX and Axiom Space medical teams, we're going to wrap up our live coverage of their historic return. AX3 lifted off from launch pad 39A on Thursday, January 18th, and arrived at station 36 hours later. They spent over 21 days in space, 18 of those days on the International Space Station before undocking just over two days ago. And this morning at 5.30 a.m. Pacific time, they splashed down off the coast of Daytona, Florida. And it has been an amazing journey. Uh, so once their first medical checks are complete, they'll catch a helicopter flight back to shore where they will transfer to a waiting aircraft ready to take them to Houston. While this concludes the flight portion of the AX3 mission, much of the research portfolios that were performed on station will continue to be reviewed and analyzed over the coming weeks. So some of their studies will even continue over the coming days and months. So Jesse, it's been an amazing time spending this <laughs> desk with you from undock all the way through splashdown. Um, it's been an absolute honor, so thank you very much. And to SpaceX, thank you for an incredible flight and taking such great care of our crew as we saw today and throughout the entire mission. Uh, to NASA and all the International Space Station partners who have enabled access to the orbiting laboratory and made the efforts of Axiom Space, Italy, Turkey, and ESA possible, thank you. We look forward to collaborating with you again soon with AX4. And all of you watching, it's been an honor and a privilege to share the journey of MLA, Walter, Alper, and Marcus to space and back again. So as we bring this mission to a close, we celebrate how the AX3 mission continues to demonstrate that the opportunities presented in microgravity have grown to include more countries, more institutions, industries, and individuals than ever before. So through missions like this, we are redefining the pathway to low Earth orbit and building for beyond. So be sure to check out axiomspace.com to learn more about flight opportunities to available along our journey to the world's first international space station. 
I'm John Rackham, and we're signing off now with a welcome home to the crew of AX3. And I'm Jesse Anderson. Thanks to everyone for joining us on another successful mission to the International Space Station. Be sure to tune in for our next human space flight mission, NASA's Crew 8, which is just a few weeks away. Check out spacex.com slash launches for updates and for the schedule of upcoming missions. We'll see you again soon.